All right, we are recording now. Welcome everybody again. So um, we are here today to take part of the second webinar in the decolonization series that we have been organizing with members of the PDD, the Participatory and Deliberative Democracy Specialist Group at PSA, the Political Science Association in the UK. Uh, but this is a joint effort with different individuals and institutions, among which are also Manchester Metropolitan University, the Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of Westminster, the Center of Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance in Canberra, uh, the Journal of Deliberative Democracy and Democratic Theory. Um, we came together to organize this webinar series and also a workshop that is taking place next week in Manchester in person, because uh, many of us have been working for quite some time now in the field of deliberative and participatory democracy or also the field of so-called democratic innovations. However, um, while this field and the researchers that uh, make it up have a um, deep-rooted conviction about the equality of all citizens and their capacity to have a say in policy making and in governance, um, the field has been slow to take up some debates in broader fields of critical theory, philosophy, reflecting not only on, um, of course, the historical underpinnings of democracies, but especially on the conditions, the historical conditions of exploitation, slavery, colonialism, and white supremacy that underlie the history of uh, Western states, especially, uh, and the way these histories also influence the institutions that we have developed and continue to develop. So traditional representative institutions, but also more innovative institutions, such as mini public citizens assemblies, participatory budgeting, and so on and so forth. Um, so many of us came together to begin to think about um, how these histories actually influence the work that we do and the institutions that we study, and also the normative commitments that um, we have regarding the theories we use and the kind of change we want to see enacted um, through participation and deliberation in the world. So um, we already held one webinar two weeks ago, um, which discussed the, the decolonization of research practice and teaching methods. And today we will be discussing um, how to approach democratic theory from a decolonial, post-colonial perspective. Um, so we will have two speakers today who are already with, with us. The first is Professor Reginald Oduo, and the second speaker will be Professor Ina Kerner. So we will, I will first give the floor to Professor Oduo, um, and I want to begin by briefly introducing him. He holds um, an MA in philosophy from Kenyatta University and a PhD in political philosophy from the University of Nairobi. He's also the first person with total visual disability to be appointed a substantive teaching position in a public university in Kenya. He's currently a senior lecturer in philosophy at the University of Nairobi, and he has lectured in many universities before and as the editor also of numerous publications, such as Africa Beyond Liberal Democracy, In Search of Context Relevant Models for, of Democracy for the 21st Century, um, and together with Dr. Oriaren Ny Nyworth, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and Francis Owaka, he edited, edited the volume Odera Oruka in the 21st Century. Um, so without further ado, I would like to now give the floor to Professor Odua, although we seem to have lost him. <laughs> Briefly. I think he's joining back. I've added him. Excellent. Um, Um, hi, Reginald, can you hear Hello, me? Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, you're back with us. I'm so sorry, my, my Wi-Fi just went bust, and um, so I have had to do some innovation, um, I guess. Uh, I hope that, so I can't use my slides anymore because um, the, 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 the system has just 
got messed up, but um, I will therefore just uh, talk. Um, and I hope that I, I will make some sense. I, I wish I could, um, I could send them over, but that would take time. So uh, can you hear me clear me, clearly? Yes, please go ahead with your presentation. Okay. I'm sorry for that technical drama. Um, um, so I will just go ahead. <clears throat> My topic today is doing democracy without the blight of elections in post-colonial African states. And uh, I will start by uh, a brief conceptualization of decolonization, after which I will look at the inadequacy of liberal democracy in, in African contexts. This will be followed by uh, reflections on the deleterious effects of party politics. Then I will talk about the impact of the conflation of nationhood and statehood, a conflation that um, liberal democracy is very famous for since the time of the Westphalian uh, treaties. And fifth, um, I will look at how elections actually stifle democracy in the polities of Africa. And finally, I will share a, some samples of proposed alternatives to elections. So I start off with um, a conceptualization of decolonization. Um, the Congolese philosopher V.Y. Mudimbe, in his famous book, The Invention of Africa, uh, informs that, us that colonialism and colonization basically mean organization or arrangement. The two words derive from the Latin word colere, meaning to cultivate or to design. So the colonizers were going out to other lands to cultivate, to design, to rearrange. Indeed, Mudimbe goes on to point out that the Western colonizers, colonizers organized and transformed non-European areas into fundamentally European constructs. And he writes, it is possible to use three main keys to account for the modulations and methods representative of colonial organization. The procedures of acquiring, uh, distributing and exploiting lands in colonies, <clears throat> the policies of uh, domesticating natives, and the manner of managing ancient organizations and implementing new modes of production. Thus, three complementary hypotheses and actions emerge the domination of physical space, the reformation of natives' minds, and the integration of local economic histories into the Western perspective. These three complementary projects constitute what might be called the colonizing structure, which completely embraces the physical, human, and spiritual aspects of the colonizing experience. So it was not just about land, that apart from physical space, the natives' minds have to be uh, reformed and the native economy has to be integrated into the European economy. Now, for us then to decolonize, we need to undo this. And that's a tall order. The Ghanaian uh, philosopher, the late Kwasi Wiredu, um, has defined conceptual decolonization thus. By conceptual decolonization, I mean two complementary things. On the negative side, I mean avoiding or reverse, reversing through a critical conceptual self-awareness, the unexamined assimilation in our thought, open brackets, that is in the thought of contemporary African philosophers, close quote, close brackets, of the conceptual frameworks embedded in the foreign uh, philosophical traditions that have had an impact on African life and thought. And on the positive side, I mean exploiting as much as is judicious the resources of our own indigenous conceptual schemes 
in our philosophical meditations on even the most technical problems of contemporary philosophy. The negative is, of course, only the reverse side of the positive. But I cite it first because the necessity for decolonization was brought upon us in the first place by the historical superimposition of foreign categories of thought on African thought systems through colonialism. So we, in decolonization, we are trying to undo what colonialism has done. Well, I, would, I could have a lot to say about that, but today I have been invited very kindly and I am most grateful to talk about how to do democracy without elections. And so I, I, I would like to look uh, uh, for a moment at the inadequacy of liberal democracy in the communalist milieu of African contexts. You see, in, in, in a paper titled Liberal Democracy, an African Critique, I give five reasons against liberal democracy in African context. First, logical inconsistency. Liberal democracy advocates the, the autonomy of the individual and yet no individual is born with an awareness of liberal ideas. They can only be taught to the young and old in a social context. So how is one to be taught liberal ideas and then assert, assert the thoroughgoing atomic individual of liberal or the liberal tradition? Secondly, it is impracticable. While liberal democracy lays emphasis on the autonomy of the individual, Many Africans have a largely communalistic outlook based on their conception of family as extending beyond their immediate household to a broad range of kingship relations that extend all the way to their ethnic groups. Besides, due to the large amount of money required to effectively compete for elective positions, liberal democracy is elitist. The third reason why it is inappropriate in African context, it is inconsistent. Uh, there is an inconsistency between affirmation and action. It is strange that those who colonized African peoples professed liberal democracy. So there is a disconnect between profession and practice. And fourthly, violation of the right to ethnic identity, liberal democracy uh, says it is culturally blind because it is focusing on the thoroughgoing individualism, uh, on the atomic individual. And yet, uh, in our communalistic outlook, we think we have a right to cultural identity. And finally, the moral imperative, imperative to assert the right to cultural emancipation. In other words, if we are truly free in the rest of the world, then we have a right to think about alternatives to liberal democracy. I'd like to look very briefly at the party, uh, at party politics, which is a central pillar of uh, many Western liberal democracies. Now, parties have not always been part of democracy, whereby a party, I mean, an, uh, a structured, institutionalized collectivity pursuing political goals. And, the, the Makerere University pro philosophy professor, Edward Wamala, has listed three problems with parties. First, the party system destroys consensus by de-emphasizing the role of the individual in political action. Put simply, the party replaces the people. So the party is the one that really calls the shots. And that is a problem because it effectively disenfranchises the people. The second reason, in order to acquire power or retain it, political parties act on the notorious Machiavellian principle that the end justifies the means, thereby, thereby draining political practice.
Mm, Reginald, can you hear us? Um, so I believe Professor Odua had some trouble with his connection. So we will just wait for a minute until he joins back. Um, I'm trying to reach Reginald on his cell phone, but it isn't working currently. So unless he joins briefly, maybe we can move on to Professor Kenner's presentation and wait for Reginald to uh, jump back into the call. Unfortunately, his connection was very unstable. Um. All right, uh, Professor Kerner, would you be so kind to um, jump into your presentation? Excellent. Um, then I will begin by introducing our second speaker today. And as soon as, as Professor Otuo can join us back, we will give back the floor to him so he can complete his presentation. Um, but um, I will now give the word to Professor Inakerna. She um, received her PhD at the Otto Suo Institute of Political Science at um, Freie Universität in Berlin. She has been appointed as a professor, researcher in several German universities and has also visited at other institutions such as the New School for Social Research, the Center for Humanities, sorry, the Center for Humanities Research at the University of the Western Cape, at quite ISM, I hope, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing anything incorrectly, um, quite, quite ISM University in Islamabad and the Center for Postcolonial Studies at Goldsmiths. And since 2017, Professor Kana is Professor of Politics in the Department of Cultural Studies of the University of Koblenz Landau. And her research focuses on postcolonial and intersectional perspectives on current social and political issues, including migration, democracy, and feminism. Thank you so much, Melissa. I just saw that uh, Reginald has re-entered, so probably it would be better that he goes first and finishes his talk, right? And then I I do mine afterwards. That's what that's it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Professor Odua, can you, help? can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes. You're back. I was can I you, just introducing. Can you see me also? Yes, we can see you as well. I'm so sorry. What did you last hear? Because I was talking away happily. What did you last hear? <laughs> uh, so I believe the last point you made was about political parties and how ends are justified, uh, means are justified by ends. That was the last okay. that I could hear. Ah, I'm so sorry. I Reginald, it might be better if you turn your video off because that might actually improve your signal. Um, and also you're muted, um, Professor Odu. I think you okay. can unmute. Yeah, you. yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Um, so I will I will try to keep to my time anyway, uh, despite the mishap. 
Um, so, yeah, so basically I was talking about the political parties disenfranchising people, and um, I will just move on, uh, that it destroys consensus, it operates on, Machiave on the Machiavellian uh, uh, approach of the end justifies the means, and it is only the few people at the top of the party who in fact uh, enjoy uh, the power. And um, I then was talking about the conflation of the nation and the state. Uh, in African countries where there are so many cultural groups forced together by colonialism, there is no, na these are not nations, they are states, because a nation has to have some element of cultural hom homogeneity. And yet this discourse on nation, na nationhood is used often to silence uh, minority cultural groups. And elections which should have uh, helped them out of this reinforces it because those with power use the power of state to retain um, their, the power. Well, elections themselves, I want to say very quickly that in five ways they stifle democracy. In one way, they alienate the masses from the political process because they are foreign. Uh, African culture generally didn't have this kind of thing. And um, on top of that, you need a lot of money to, 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 to actually stand for office successfully. And I would add the processes of elections are complex. The second way in which elections actually stifle democracy, and there is actually an article on the loop, which I did on this, is it disregards the citizens' voices through majoritarianism because a real democracy should listen to everybody. Majoritarianism and party politics um, silences many voices. Thirdly, the competitive nature of elections is an obstacle to the pursuit of the common good because people are thinking of winning as their faction or as individuals. The fourth way in which elections stifle the, the democracy is the divisive nature of elections uh, the divisive nature of elections, coupled with a perceived advantage enjoyed by incumbents, is an obstacle to citizen solidarity. Elections divide the, 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 the society. After every election, there are such terrible tensions. And fifthly, elections are a cause of instability because the dissatisfaction often ends up with violence. And I would dare add a sixth one, that elections perpetuate neocolonialism. Every election, we have people, uh, so-called election observers, coming to tell us that, that we are doing well or we are not. And I am waiting for the day when the Germans or the British will invite Kenyans to observe elections and write reports. So it's a, a source of neocolonialism. I then want to share in the last um, five minutes or so, if I may, several sample proposals as alternatives to elections. I know I've spent a lot of time laying the ground, but I think it helps one to follow the rationale. Now, based on a communitarian conception of the person, that the person is not an, auto, is not an atomic being, but is very much engrossed in a web of social networks, Kwasi we read with the Ghanaian uh, philosopher whom we sadly lost at the beginning of the year, uh, he prescribes a no-party consensual democracy. A no-party consensual democracy. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Good. Thank you. Um, and then we have um, um, a second proposal uh, by... Um, um, a person called Uchena Okeja from Nigeria, and he is very strong on deliberative democracy because he is of the view that this is how uh, the peoples of Africa can regain agency in the political domain and can have some therapy against the violence that has made them feel that politics has no uh, benefit to them. So he emphasizes uh, deliberative democracy, and he has a book that came out, I believe, last year that uh, you can look out for from Indiana University Press. 
Other thinkers, such as Ludeki Chwea, advocates for an eclectic system with elements of liberal democracy, but founded on traditional political thought and practice, such as is done in Somaliland, where the, the upper chamber of parliament is constituted of clan elders who are chosen by the clans in their own way. The lower chamber is elected on a typical democratic, uh, liberal democratic uh, fashion. Now, I have recently uh, done a book called Africa Beyond Liberal Democracy. It's an edited volume with 14 different chapters. And there are several thinkers have proposed alternatives to liberal democracy. David Ngendo Chimba warns that when a society has gone through conflict, such as has happened in the Congo, elections are not a good way and not an appropriate way for reconstruction. It is important first to deal with issues such as security, uh, social services, and all the things that make a state acceptable and worthwhile. But the, the system has been, the United Nations system quickly hurry and conduct elections, which then cause further conflicts. Um, and then we have Emetiana Ezani, who proposes a pyramidal cooperative collegial democracy, where you do not have general elections, but you have at the local level, the selection of leaders who then go to a larger region to select leaders for the larger region until you get to the uh, state level, what you will call the national level. I have pain using that. And I myself, I have proposed what I called ethnically based federations, which I would now prefer to call culturally based federations, so that um, people may have some respite from the foreignness of the modern state by organizing their local political space in a way that makes sense to them. I thank you for listening to me and very sorry for those technical troubles. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And um, I think I will now directly give the word to Professor Kerner, who I briefly introduced <laughs> some moments ago. Uh, Professor Kerner, you. Um, you have the floor. Thank you. Oops. Thank you very much. I will um, share my screen and hope this will work. Um, okay, do you see it in presentation mode? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, um, Thank you so much for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here. What I will present is a short version of an article I recently published in German in a political theory um, journal called Zeitschrift für Politische Theorie. For those of you who know German and read German, uh, here's the link. Um, it came out in a special issue on post-coloniality and the crisis of democracy and is very recommendable, I think. Now I need to see, okay. Um, what I do in the next 20 minutes, um, which is basically what is in that text, and sorry, I need to, okay, is um, reflect on the coloniality of liberal democracy by drawing on select authors in the field of post-colonial theory. And there will be basically three claims and a conclusion. Claim one is that Western democracy in the modern era was shaped by colonial constellations of power and domination from the very beginning. Claim two is that Western models of democracy are fed by non-Western sources, even though they usually don't acknowledge that. Claim three is that there are non-Western democratic systems of governance that are driven by standards of good governance that make Western models of liberal democracy look comparatively undemocratic. That claim actually fits very nicely with uh, what uh, Reginald has just presented. And in the conclusion, um, there will be some theoretical and practical implications of a post-colonial critique of democracy. When I conceptualized and wrote that piece, I had um, as an audience, political and democratic theory people, particularly in German language context in mind, um, I wrote the piece in, in, in German, um, and this is why I'm particularly grateful for this chance to present it here 
today in an international audience and very much hope that you'll find that um, helpful in one way or the other um, as well. The diagnostic starting points. Um, the first one is basically, and the second one is, um, they are, well, the first one is, is pretty much um, tied to political theory, because the political theory narrative on democracy is still, I would say, in a problematic way, focused, pretty much focused on Europe and Western countries. Um, democracy is imagined to have been invented by the so-called old Greeks, ancient Greeks, um, and this saying Plato tornado is, I think, um, demonstrating this tradition or this narrative in a pretty um, straightforward way. Um, democracy thereby appears as a particularly Western achievement and particularly liberal democracy appears as a good export product. And the promotion of democracy and of good governance as areas of development politics are a sort of practical case in point. At the same time, there is more and more the contention that liberal democracy in Europe and other Western countries is at its limits and under contestation. Uh, Colin Crouch has famously called this post-democracy and that the export of liberal democracy often is not successful. And extreme cases um, that we all know are Afghanistan and Iraq, where democracy was supposed to be fostered by war, but also the less extreme cases often don't show the success that is um, wanted. Post and decolonial studies critically reflect on these problems for quite some time, and this is no coincidence. As Jean and John Komarov say, the Global South can be seen as a frontier in the unfolding history of neoliberalism and as the planetary context or the set of planetary contexts that affords privileged insights into the workings of the world at large, meaning that things are happening in the global south that might happen in the future or have started happening also in European countries and other countries of the northern hemisphere which makes it um, makes gives another reason for occupying us with these contexts, even when we are located, say, in Europe. Post and decolonial studies make the additional point next to this neoliberalism point that some of the problems of liberal democracy may be older than neoliberalism and stem from its coloniality. And when I say coloniality, I refer to Anibal Quijano's notion of the coloniality of power, which basically means contemporary forms of political and social power, um, that contemporary forms of political and social power are tainted by colonial, which means racial modes of thought and organization. I come back to claim one, um, which is Western democracy in the modern area was shaped by colonial constellations of power and domination from the very beginning. And um, I refer here in the paper to Achille Mbembe, um, both um, the critique of black reason and the politics of enmity, where he makes the case that, um, or makes the point that colonial racism is deeply inscribed in Western democracy. There is sort of an historical argument saying that, for instance, the US um, was for a long time what he calls a democratic slave state, and also that European democracies have for a long time been engaged in colonialism, which also was based on extreme forms of racism. So there are some double standards here, which aren't only external, but in a way infused in democracy itself. Um, racial profiling, police violence against um, black and people of color, thousands of deaths on the Mediterranean Sea, namely people who try to migrate to Europe and camps for potential migrants are from Bembe continuities of colonial racism working in current liberal democracies. They're in a way being perpetuated instead of um, by the states at least um, severely fought. Of course, we all know that there is a lot of resistance against this by people, but still. The other author I refer to um, is James Tully, a political theorist from Canada, and he makes the point that Western democracy and Western democracy promotion in the global south is basically a tool of free trade imperialism, at least 
implicitly. He, um, he, his point is that many international institutions and the, and the legal norms, international legal norms, have from their inception served Western trade interests. He talks about informal imperialism in this regard. And his point is, um, and this is how it connects to democracy, that this informal imperialism and say the state and legal global system that, um, that, that relies on um, fosters low intensity democracy in the on the national level in those states in which these imperial powers have interests in, interests in securing access to resources and markets. Um, so the idea is, or what Tali's point is, is that, um, say, imperial countries foster low intensity democracy, basically in the global south. Now, he says that there's a lot of protest against those kind of low intensity democracy, um, and also against um, formal informal versions of imperialism on these local or national levels, and that they, these are often answered by authoritarian means, something that we like to call then um, 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 examples of failed statehood. Um, but he says that this kind of failed statehood shall rather be interpreted as an effect of processes kicked off by informal imperialism um, rather than something um, else, even though usually they are seen as something else and then are used as an excuse for even more imperial intervention. Second claim, Western models of democracy are fed by non-Western sources. Here I rely on an article by Iris Marin Young, which came out again in her book, um, Global Challenges from 2007. Iris Marin Young, political theorist from the US, um, um, looks at the federal system of the Haudenosaunee, um, a, an indigenous um, group of, um, of, of nations in North America. And um, her point is that that federal system basically influenced um, the North American federalist ideas. Um, they influenced it, but this influence was at the same time dethematized. And she basically makes or um, has two claims that, that come from this. One is a, say, historical one regarding political theory and the um, and its canon and the story it tells about itself, which is the acknowledgement of the influence of that um, Haudenosaunee um, federal system. Um, um, so, so she is in favor of an acknowledgement of its influence for correcting the biases, the Eurocentric biases of the in the history of democratic ideas. But for her, there is also a systematic reason for looking at that system, which is that that system to her entails a model of post-sovereign political self-determination that for her points the way ahead. And this is a sh short quote from Young's essay uh, where she depicts that system and she says, what federalism meant to the Iroquois was an assumption of, sorry, no, I don't see one word, uh, of self-determination for the member nations at the same time as a commitment to procedural unity with the other five nations and the willingness to have any issue considered for federal decision-making. Indian governance can be considered democratic, moreover, at least because of the following attributes. Leaders were chosen on merit, although they usually came from designated families. They were expected to respond to public opinion and in extreme cases could be impeached if they abused their power. Issues and policy proposals could come from anywhere in the Federation. Decision-making relied on deliberation, both within and among member nations and included mechanisms of review. So Young basically says this was a democratic and a particularly interesting democratic system, whereas in traditional political and democratic theory storytelling, it's not mentioned at all. And that should be changed. Claim number three, and that fits nicely, I think, to what we've just heard from Reginald. Um, 
is the claim that there are non-Western democratic systems of governance that are driven by standards of good governance that make Western models of liberal democracy look comparatively undemocratic. Here I, um, I refer to an essay by Jean and John Komarov from their book, Theory from the South, where they look at the Setswana governance system in um, Botswana, but sort of before the, the, the old one, the, um, the pre-colonial one and, and partly colonial one. Um, um, that and, and they say that that system, uh, looking at a system, shows the limits of procedural democracy, the representative parliamentary system with um, periodic elections. Um, what they do is um, draw critical attention to the de deliberative participatory consultation system of Setswana governance in order to do two things or show two things, explain voting behavior that according to European standards uh, seemed irritating, which was that people didn't really turn out, turn up or turn out for elections in large numbers when it was mostly elections were mostly to, uh, or when, when the, the person running for highest office was someone who had been running before. Um, and the second, the second point is to gain ground for critical analysis of the Western model of liberal democracy that is based on local democratic practices and experiences. And this is what they mean by theory from the South. And what they try to show in this essay is that um, from the perspective of that Setswana governance model, only having a say in governance every four or five years when going to elections seemed pretty undemocratic to people who were used to a system of constant possibilities to um, consult those in power. I already come to my conclusion. Um, and I first will sort of um, quickly go back to the elements of the coloniality of liberal democracy that I think you can extract from these um, theoretical sources that I have used. First of all, liberal democracy has gone along with structural institutionalized or at least tolerated, institutionally tolerated, tolerated by the institutions, forms of racism from its beginning. Um, which means that liberal democracy, since it has been gone along structurally with these forms of racism, is unlikely to be a sufficient means against current forms of colonial racism, but rather needs race critical analysis and restructuring itself. The second point is that liberal democracy has been an instrument and element of free trade imperialism, which means that it's not an innocent model of governance, um, and this might explain some of the skepticism that it is met with outside of Europe. Third, liberal democracy is more hybrid than it portrays itself, or at least sort of current forms of democracy that are also liberal. And fourth, democracy is not exclusively European with regard to its origin. Fifth point is that bad governance in post colonies can at least partly be described as a colonial and hence Western export. So the question is what might alternatives look like? And um, at least the three political theorists that I have referred to, not so much the Komarovs as um, anthropologists who usually um, don't engage in normative theorizing. Um, the three political theorists come up in their articles with, um, with sort of alternatives, their articles and books. Um, and what I find important is that at least in those people I have looked at the aim, the overall aim of the critical, um, critical engagement with liberal democracy is not so much an abolition of liberal democracy, a full fledged sort of getting rid of it, and, a, and neither a rehabilitation of pre-colonial governance models, but rather making democracy stronger, more democratic. Um, Achille Mbembe um, offers a planetary or sort of argues in favor of a planetary ethics that transcends racial boundaries and counts with human vulnerability and precariousness. So to him, anti-racism 
becomes, or with him, anti-racism becomes a core feature of democratization. And I find this important because often, I would say in political theory at least, democratization is often imagined, imagined rather in procedural terms. What kind of um, mechanisms to include more people in decision-making is the focus, but here anti-racist mechanisms become a central feature for transcending the racial aspect of the coloniality of liberal democracy. Second point with Tully is a fostering of strong high intensity forms of democracy on the local level and national level in the global south, as well as legal pluralism. He comes with, a, or he introduces this conception of democratic constitutionalism with de facto possibilities for participation and change. And um, he contact, or he makes the point that often um, neoliberal structural adjustment measures that actually make, uh, that, that they often hinder uh, de facto possibilities for participation. What is important, I think, concerning Tully as young is that both um, call for matter, measures that go beyond including more citizens in policy making. They are also calling for including people basically in policy making, in trying to figure out how the entire state and democratic system should look like, uh, say in the, in the basically found, foundational process. Um, and in Young's, ter, uh, Young's case, this is um, learning from the Haudenosaunee model. Um, she is very much in favor of their decentered, diverse, democratic federalism model as a form of governance without sovereignty, which means that it transcends the nation state and nation sovereignty is as local po as possible and involves those affected regarding all sorts of cases, issues, and problems. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kerner. I, um, I will now open the floor for questions. We have around 10 minutes. So I would suggest to gather maybe three questions and then um, give the word back to Professor Skerner and Udo for uh, responses. Please feel free to either jump in, so raise your hand on Zoom or write your question in the chat. Um, we already have one question by Gihad Hassanin. Please go ahead. Um, hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, uh, okay. Um, so thank you both, that was, um, that was wonderful. Um, I, I just had a question, it's, it's more to Dr. Reginald, but um, like, I think um, you both touched on it, but Dr. Kerner and, and Dr. Reginald. Um, is it, I, I mean, so it's, it's important to, de to, to think about democracy in new ways that are more democratic and to, to realize, okay, that there are more democratic alternatives. But when we're talking about decolonizing democracy, shouldn't we also like be drawing a line between decolonization as a first step that would even enable democracy in a post-colonial context? Because the problem in a post-colonial context is not just that democracy doesn't work, it's also that the, the boundaries of the political community are drawn in certain ways that certain groups are either entirely excluded or excluded until they're civilized enough to be included and, and therefore decolonization, it, it would need um, kind of renegotiating the, the boundaries of, of the political community. So not even just designing the polity as, as the, um, Professor Kerner said and designing the system, but even renegotiating between people living on that territory that we, we are all equal and we all have um, an equal say even in designing this system that we're talking that that we want for all of us, whether that system would be uh, giving autonomy to ethnic groups or whether it would fall back on elections or you know however the frequency of those elections will be, isn't this all like a second step that that first needs this um, this notion of of negotiating. Um, for the polity as a whole, for for the entire territory, even if it doesn't, even if it's 
dominated by a single state that's that's dominating multiple ethnicities and nations it doesn't decolonization also require that all of these come together and say well this is the territory that we have and there are people who are already invested in it even if they're doing exclusion exclusions to other groups but we we all have to live with each other at the end so isn't that like a necessary first step that we also need to think about first um sorry <laughs> that took a long time thank you Thank you very much, Gehad. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right and apologize if not. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? Please feel free to either raise your hand, open your mic or write it in the chat. So we have a question in the chat. I will proceed to read it out loud uh, from Mahmoud Koroma. Unless Mahmoud, you would like to um, to jump in and open your mic and um, pose your question yourself. Otherwise I can read it. All right. Um, so Mahmoud Koroma appreciates the presentations, but would like to ask both presenters to shed light on the African pre-colonial democratic systems. Um, the suggestion from the lectures is that the democratic systems that we are familiar with are total exports. And we also have a comment from Michelle Small, who says, um, who also thanks the presenters and says that she thinks one of the dangers of looking to the past or even local deliberative cultural structures is that it perpetuates different forms of bias and inequality, for instance, through age, gender. So an alternative need to speak to these microdynamics as well. Um, I would now, um, I think I would stop here for now and give the word back to Reginald and Ina, if that's okay. Uh, Reginald, would you like to go first? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I was thinking um, Ina could go first, uh, uh, if, if she would like to, and then I can come in, but I'm open to, yeah. Wow, uh, would you like Kerner, Professor well, Kerner to go first? I can, yeah, I can, yeah, but yeah, I don't please, have please. to. Yeah, I'll be happy if you if you do. Yeah. Okay, so thank you so much Conce for all the questions. Concerning the first one, yes. I mean, my answer is yes, I totally agree. And I would even say that Tully, for instance, means exactly this, that um, not only question, and I mean, that, that, that the question that has to be raised it, no, that has to be answered in a, in a good way is not only how to do it, but also, I mean, everybody has to be included. And also, I, I would say that uh, Young's all-inclusive, um, all-affected uh, idea speaks to that. And I think it's sort of quite, I mean, what I find quite convincing reading these post and decolonial critiques of liberal democracy is that the problem is larger than and I think this is what you said, the, the problem is larger than the democratic institutions themselves. They are infused by coloniality, influenced, informed by coloniality, and that in a way makes them problematic. And um, so the undoing is a bigger one. But of course, I guess it makes sense also to look at um, or, or to probably tackle the problem from, from different sides. But the but the racism that is that is still in the world since colonial times that that has to be undone by itself and in all sorts of institutional ways, I believe that that is very true and and that is also part of your question, I think. African pre-colonial systems, I think that Reginald can answer this much better than I do um, because of his um, much greater expertise in this, but the the case that the Komarovs refer to is a case in which instead of elections every say four years and a situation in which the people outside from elections doesn't really have a say because it basically delegates their say to representatives that there was a system of constant consultations and people expected to see 
the governors and and were um, and expected to be able to sort of consult and that in a way um the transfer of power from the people to governors was not every four years by an election but rather in a performative way all the time and one could lose power all the time as well so for them in their interpretation that makes it in a way more democratic because the the need of governors to of governors um to to um I mean, they, they couldn't only be out elect, elected out of office every four years. They had to prove themselves all the time by standards of good governance. Um, um, full stop. The, the third question, I totally agree. I mean, this is just a snippet of or a one, 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 one view that is not at all inclusive. And there are all sorts of other biases, gender ones, for instance and that uh, those ones and colonial ones intersect in complex ways. Um, I totally agree um, that that has to be done as well. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ghana. Uh, Professor Oudwald, would you like to also respond to, the, to any of all the questions? Can you hear me now? Yes. Right, um, I'll stand this first. Yeah, the, the first question about is the entire prior work to, to actually undertake um, decolonization more broadly construed before we can even talk about democratic, decolonizing democracy. I totally agree. In fact, I think that, uh, that, that we have to think in terms of uh, what people like Samira mean uh, would think about as political economy. We, however much we work on the political sphere, if the economic structure is, is stacked up against the masses, is stacked up against, uh, uh, is stuck up, uh, they, it is, you know, stuck up against those who have been disenfranchised, then things won't change. So, yes. And in fact, that's why in, a, in, a, in the previous webinar, I was asking, okay, we are here. I don't know that it was me or somebody else asking. We are here talking about decolonizing, but we are, uh, particularly those of us from Africa, we are getting European style degrees, working in European style universities. And therefore, how far can we go in terms of dismantling the structures of domination. And, 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 and it's, it's quite a limiting uh, situation in that sense. So yes, we need to decolonize much more than democracy. We need to de decolonize economics. And above all, we need to decolonize the process of knowledge production. That something is coming on the world and I don't see social uh, political theories talking much about it. The fourth industrial revolution uh, uh, artificial intelligence, greater surveillance. It's taking away our liberties. And here we are seated only talking about elections and things like that. That will need to come into the discussions because it's going to take away liberty all over the world. It has that potential at least, if not checked. The second question, uh, Uh, Reginald, I think, yes. sorry, yes. we, we just lost you at the beginning of the second question. Okay, I, am I back? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, the second question I am thinking uh, that what we are, I was, we were asked about pre-colonial book, edited volume, a uh, companion to African philosophy there. And also in his book uh, called um, Particulars, and Particulars and Universals, um, uh, where an African perspective, and that one is also by Indiana University Press. He has an article uh, there where he looks at the Akan democratic system. They had queens or kings, both in among the Akan, and also the Baganda had a monarchy but they were extremely democratic. And incidentally, I never hear anybody wondering whether Britain is a democracy, or it's as a heavily 
feudalistic establishment at the top of it. Now, the third, uh, the, the, the issue that was raised about whether by looking to the past we won't introduce new differences such as gender and so on, I would say uh, that would be a great worry if contemporary one does not have differences. But these differences have been there. So in fact, if we were to say looking back is, is, might introduce such differences, we would be suggesting right now there are not many differences or there are none at all. And yet there are a lot of them that come straight from the past. So I think we shouldn't hesitate to look at uh, the past and the present and just work with what will serve us best uh, and in, in the process ensure that we are inclusive. inclusive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Reginald. Um, so I just wrote in the chat if anyone else has a question. I see that Michelle um, has posted a question. We are a little bit over time. So I will read Michelle's question and I will offer Professor Kernan and Professor Oduo one minute to respond and then I will uh, close the webinar for today. Uh, Michelle Small asks, do the speakers believe that elections can make a difference or does the very colonial structure of politics uh, and democracy and economics, neoliberalism, mean that elections will only reproduce the limits of the Westphalian West failure order. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle, for your question. Um, Professor Kerner, would you like to go first? Yes, it's an interesting question. I would, I'm a political theorist. I cannot say don't go vote, but I, I, I mean, I, I do think that elections make a difference, but the question is which kind of difference? I, I still think it makes a difference in most cases. Of course, it depends on the country and on who is running for office, but usually it makes a difference to at least a small one in small issues concerning, um, I mean, the question of who wins an election. And sometimes it's a rather big difference. There is a difference of whether you have a fascist in power or not, for instance. And there are several countries that um, are sort of being threatened by, by uh, really right-wing um, people who are in power or running for power. Um, the elections are able to undo the coloniality of anything I don't believe, unfortunately. I think for that much more is needed, much broader change. Um, yeah, so I would I would answer with a reserved um, yes and no. I mean, yeah, I hope I made myself clear. Thank you, Professor Kenner. Professor Odua, would you like to uh, briefly reply to Michelle's question? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I would agree with Professor Karna that uh, elections make some little differences. For example, in my own country, after whenever a new president comes to power, they announce something exciting. And, and I guess that, that's a difference. But in terms of the real differences that matter, no, elections don't make that difference. And in fact, elections long term and liberal democracy with an emphasis on election long term, I believe always end, uh, ends up with tyranny. Uh, if I am right, even Adolf Hitler was democratically elected and you know where that went. And, and I, would, I would refer you to to democracy in Kenya and a, a smaller, shorter version of it in the loop how elections stifle democracy in Kenya. <clears throat> but I would also like refer you to a novel, this novel, Lord of the Flies, um, by William Golding. The boys are in an island, and in fact, they have a very credible election, but the result is that the one who was defeated goes off and starts pulling away other boys and forms a tribe. And by the end of it, the island is almost burning. They start burning up the, the island as they fight until somebody from outside comes to, to save the situation. So I would say elections, by virtue of it having winners and losers, always lays a seed for contention and for conflict. And yet true democracy 
is governance by the people, all the people, not by the majority. The majority thing is a thing from the industrial revolution, marketing, or oh, you know, opinion polling is really market surveys. And it really just has the logic of capitalism, which is itself exclusionist anyway. I always call liberal democracy the political wing of capitalism. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Skerner and Otuo. We are slightly over time, so I'm going to uh, one last time invite anyone who has one last question if they want to raise their hands and post them or post them in the chat. Otherwise, I'll begin to conclude this session by, of course, thanking our speakers and thanking the audience for joining. Um, it was a really thought-provoking session with um, a lot of input on both from, from the side of both presenters and I think very provocative questions as well uh, from the audience. And I think your contributions uh, have been also really important to the conversations that we are going to have in the workshop we're hosting in person next week in Manchester. Um, so thank you once more for joining. And uh, to the audience, I think someone asked about the slides, if Professor Kerner could share her slides. I just want to let the audience know that we record these sessions because we later post them on the YouTube channel of the PDD, the Participatory and Deliberative Democracy Specialist Group of the PSA. And you will also see them in the blog of the PDD. I will now share the link with everyone. Um, on that blog, you can also find the link to the previous webinar, to a previous session organized last year on decolonizing democratic innovations. And you will also be able to find the presentations from today. For now, um, thank you very much and um, have a nice weekend everybody thank you thank you very much thank you bye everybody thank you